Their own intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. The first big city to fall was Kunduz, one after another. Afghanistan's biggest cities outside of Kabul were captured, Herat to the west. Terrorists in Kabul carrying out the deadliest attack on U.S. troops in over a decade. Afghanistan is lost. Move it! Freedom came under attack. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes. At my direction, a small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage. They killed Osama bin Laden. Al-Baghdadi is dead. It's time to end America's longest war. We'll do it responsibly. Rushing to the airports, behind them, the sound of gunfire. Deliberately. Countless Afghans who helped American troops were left behind. In safety. Afghans by the thousands desperate to escape life under the Taliban. I'm joined by former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley. Ambassador Haley served her home state of South Carolina as a congresswoman for six years and then governor for another six years before she was named as U.N. Ambassador by President Trump. For two years, Haley represented the United States on the world stage and has extensive knowledge of international policy and conflict. During her tenure in the U.N., she stood up to nations that sponsor or endorse terrorism and human rights violations such as Iran, Syria, and North Korea. Ambassador Haley has also been a fervent supporter of the state of Israel. It's September 30th, 2021. We are joined today by former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley. And uh, Ambassador Haley, it's great to talk to you today and thank you for taking time. But you know, we're, this whole experiment that we've been doing for the last month, this series has been on everything that's happened in Afghanistan. But you know, obviously we're gonna be talking about the UN. We're gonna be talking a lot about what's happened to the UN. But I do wanna go back just a little bit because before that you were governor of South Carolina, you were involved in, in politics locally. When you see these images and you're on the ground, you meet people in South Carolina who are you know, not necessarily just Washingtonians and people who are dealing with politics. You see these images coming out of Afghanistan the last month. What is your reaction to that? Some of these, you know, obviously heartbreaking, horrifying images. And what is it like uh, for the people uh, that, that you interact with? You know, it's painful um, because, you know, South Carolina is a big military state. I, as governor, watched um, units deploy to Afghanistan. I, as governor, had my own husband deployed to Helmand province in Afghanistan. And so I know the sacrifices that so many military men and women have made. And I know what their families have made. And, you know, for them to watch videos of the Taliban, you know, driving our vehicles, holding our guns and wearing our uniforms all while making fun of Americans is just, it's painful to anyone who's ever served there. And the idea that we left them with $85 billion worth of ammunition and equipment, the idea that we abandoned Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies, without telling our Afghan partners, um, the one Intel hub that was so important to NATO, it was reckless. And, you know, now to turn around and have Biden say Al Qaeda is not in Afghanistan when all his generals have said the opposite of that. As a matter of fact, we all know when the Taliban took over, they released all the Al Qaeda prisoners from the prisons for him to say we weren't going to leave any Americans behind. And literally, he put his military against the moral code of you never leave an American behind. Or whether it's the fact that he claimed that the Afghan military could have handled it. You ask any person who ever served there, they could tell you the Afghan military could never do it by themselves. They, they had the fight, they had the heart, they had the sacrifice, but they needed leadership to tell them what to do and where to do it. And so it's just been an embarrassment all the way around. When you look at it from the UN perspective, someone who's been there, obviously yourself, uh, we saw the world leaders address the UN just recently. President Biden gave his first address you know the UN practically better than anyone. I'm just curious, contrasting what you've seen and then what you experienced in the previous administration, just contrast that a bit to me. Tell me what that what that feels like to you as someone who's been there. 
Well, you know, I told someone when I saw Biden's speech, it was the first time that I could say out loud, I was truly embarrassed because I know how those countries think. I know what they expect of us. Um, you know, the, the thing that President Trump and all of us did that served him was we made sure that the world knew what America was for and what we were against. We didn't care if they liked us, but we wanted them to understand us. And what I saw were the UN ambassadors very much wanted America to lead. Even if they badmouthed us, they wanted us to leave because they'd rather follow the United States than China or Russia any day of the week. And to see Biden go there, not mention China by name, not talk about the new terrorist threat that we have, not call out human rights abuses that were happening in Venezuela, Cuba, China, and so many other places, not acknowledge COVID and say anything about that. There were so many things he left undone, but this was the thing. I did an event on the outskirts of the UN and met a fellow diplomat that I knew. And he said, you know, we all watched to see Biden's speech. And he said, and we all were looking forward to seeing which direction the US was gonna go. He said, we're all left scratching our heads. He said, because it was a vanilla speech and it gave us no guidance whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's just horrible. I wanted to get to certainly our adversaries or, or China or Russia, and we'll get to that in a minute here. But let's talk about that and our allies who have relied on the U.S. Look, for a lot of people would say maybe too much, but rely on the U.S. Uh, for what they uh, they need, are now seeing the imagery, are seeing the verbiage coming out of the president's mouth. And, and there is a deep concern, it seems, from even not just our adversaries, but from our allies that the United States may not be uh, the future strong voice that it's been. And uh, how, how do you combat that? You know, it's amazing that when I was at the United Nations, no one wanted to meet unless the U.S. was in the room. And now you've got the fact that NATO is having meetings and they don't even think U.S. needs to be in the room. I mean, that's how far we've fallen. That's how dangerous it's gotten. And, you know, there's a lot of repairs that need to be made here. And I know Biden came and said at the U.N., the U.S. is back. We're back with diplomacy. We're back with all this. You know what, it's not, countries don't want the niceties. That's not what they're talking about. They wanna know you're gonna have their back. They wanna know that you're gonna lead and they can follow. They don't wanna wonder what you're thinking that day when you wake up in the morning. And I think that, you know, you see it where France is trying to tell the EU that they need to become less dependent on the US, not less dependent on China, less dependent on the US, which is shocking. The idea that the US is now asking Russia for help in dealing with Afghanistan, which is, unthinkable and you know the idea that we're not we have no plans on how we're going to go and counter terrorism and not once did biden say we should not acknowledge the taliban as the head of the afghanistan government i mean that was a prime opportunity for the u.s to lead the charge that we cannot acknowledge the taliban we can't give them aid we can't in any way recognize them and he missed the mark on that. Right, again. right, and it keeps missing that mark. The you know bring back or build back better, and America's back coming from the Biden administration. Great words to to say uh, verbally, but then you see the narrative that presented the UN. You see the uh, the fumbled, horrible withdrawal of Afghanistan. Can those two things can't exist? That that can't be the the narrative. You can't have one and the other. It seems. Well, I think what you're going to see is look. Words can get you through the first month of your presidency but without action you're not going to get that not only has there been inaction there's been wrong action and so all of our allies see that the world is less safe now all of our allies see how quickly we folded in afghanistan they know we left our afghan partners behind they know that we left americans behind it goes against anything that they know and so where do we go from here because it's not just complaining it's what do we do about it the one thing that I think went well was getting the agreement with the U.S., Australia, um, and the U.K. to start allowing um, the submarines for Australia so that they can counter China. We need to be doing more of that. We need to get together with the Quad, U.S., India, um, Australia, and make sure that we're finding out ways with Japan, finding out ways that we can all counter China, that we can all work towards that. And we've got to start talking to our friends and saying, okay, this is what we need to do and this is how we need to do it. But all we're seeing from Biden is, you know, a tax and spend policy that doesn't address foreign policy, doesn't address what average families are going through because inflation has kicked in. And it's just really wondering 
where's the leadership here? Absolutely. And China and Russia, as you said, have been brought into this conversation, uh, maybe more than even I anticipated with Afghanistan when the, the withdrawal was happening. But now all of a sudden we're seeing situations that have unfolded with whether you know we we're going to be using Russian military bases or, or any of China's interests. We've talked now about our allies, but what about our adversaries? They've been brought into this conversation and we know they both want major influence. So what do we do when we've just abandoned this region? Now, I think you can expect China to go in and make a major move for Bagram Air Force Base. They've wanted the minerals in Afghanistan for a long time. Afghanistan's already said, the Taliban has already said they want to work with China. So we have lost that foothold. I think you're looking, all you got to do is, is turn on the TV or open up your utility bills. Natural gas is going up. Russia Biden just gave him Nord Stream 2, which gives him all the money he needs, all the influence and power he wants, um, and makes our European allies um, more vulnerable and dependent on Russia. So, I mean, I think that Russia hacked um, the U.S. We saw it in the pipeline. We saw it in the food processing plant. I dealt with Russia enough to know that was Russia's way of not hurting America. It was their way of testing us. They wanted to know how we were going to handle it. And Biden literally did nothing, which allowed China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, all those that do realize that that is the cheapest form of warfare. You're now going to see further and further hacks that are more and more serious because Biden has shown he's not going to hold anyone accountable. Yeah, I think people are concerned about the weakness. They're concerned about that on, on a global scale. And you, know, you brought up uh, the Taliban being treated with this respect as someone who obviously has family who who served, direct family members who have served and were in Afghanistan. Just the fact that, and I brought this up in a lot of these interviews because I think we've all had very similar reactions. How do you feel with just hearing the term the Taliban being treated with some form of respect after 20 years of what we've known, plus 20 years plus now, of what we've known, just the fact that it's it seems like it's just in the lexicon, it's rolling off people's tongue. Oh yeah, we work with the Taliban now. I mean, you can't trust the Taliban any more than we can trust Iran. You can't trust terrorists. You can't work with terrorists because you're dealing with an ideology and their ideology is that they hate America. And so that premise is never going to change. So we can't be naive enough to say, oh, we can move them or we can sway them. We have to be smart enough to let them know we're on to them. We're going to hold them to account. We're not going to let them get away with anything. That's what we should be doing. Absolutely, and, and we have to work somewhat with them. And that's been a question that has come up. The Taliban has asked, as, again, as someone who obviously was deeply involved in the UN, they've asked for UN credentials, the Taliban has, uh, and a speaking spot. Uh, you led the United States to not officially recognize the Taliban uh, or to provide them aid. Why would this be a mistake? Because I think some people do look at it and go, well, we have to work with them. It's the inevitability of the situation. But why would you think this would be a mistake for the US and the UN to recognize the Taliban as a, as a legitimate government? Well, the U.S. should not ever want to work with the Taliban because the Taliban is the one that allowed Al Qaeda to make its moves on 9-11 and have over 3,000 people die because of it. Um, you know, when you look at these terrorist groups, they all stick together and you can't take their word for it. And I think we see that. We see that in the fact that women are no longer allowed to work in government. They've taken girls out of schools. They're doing forced marriages again. They've got dead bodies hanging in the streets to show what will happen if you don't listen to them. That's not a government we should ever want to recognize. And it's certainly not a government that you want to give money to. And and when they talk about recognition at the UN, what that means is aid to the Taliban. So we don't want to give aid to the Taliban. Um, that's, that's just not an option that we should ever have on the table. And we should never think it's about working with the Taliban. We couldn't work with them before. We can't work with them now. It's never going to be an option. So we've got to figure out another way to get hold of this and figure out how we're going to get a fighting force there that's not Americans necessarily, but to find out an allied contingency that we can go to start getting a hold of the terrorist movements that are happening. Yeah, and beyond that, we have to keep this going in the media. I think that this is always a concern with American news cycle, which is obviously most of the press left, as I don't blame them for leaving Afghanistan. We have a few people who are still there. We did see a bit of a uniting uh, in terms of we've had, look, as you went through it yourself, years of a very, very biased media uh, towards the administration you were part of. We have seen, maybe for the first time, and I, I brought this up, I was like, after September 11th, the, the country unified, even to support the president. Maybe in the converse of that, 
after this happened, we all kind of unified against what we're seeing is horrific and horrendous, but it's easy for, for media to move on. It's easier for politicians to move on to the next topic. So we need to make sure that this stays at the forefront because this is one of those things that universally, I think everyone looking at this and looking at the visuals can say, this was a mistake. And it actually can applaud the media for maybe for the first time in, in many years, uh, actually doing what they're supposed to do. I think the liberal media is embarrassed. They know that they propped up Biden. They know that they gave him, you know, basically a pass when he was running for president. They're giving him a pass for a few months. Now they're embarrassed. And it's not just, you know, what we're seeing in Afghanistan. It's what you're seeing with all the Haitians under the bridge. You know, it's it's the fact that the border situation's out of control. It's the fact that, you know, they've got, he's chosen the teachers unions over schools. I think we're gonna start to see the liberal media have to come out against Biden because they are embarrassed at the fact that they can't give him a pass anymore. And I think we just need to continue to highlight that and show how terrible this is because we're not three years into this, we're about nine months into right. this. And that means we've got a ways to go still. Right, it's an easy thing to forget three years down the road. And it was one of those topics, look, I believe that President Trump's uh, destruction of ISIS and all of the, the moves they made, the Abraham Accords, were all incredibly positive uh, things that maybe didn't get a recognition, they didn't get the recognition they deserved. And they also weren't brought up enough when uh, the last election was happening. It wasn't one of those constant topics where I feel like a lot of people forgot. They forgot that, that ISIS happened. They forgot that Israel was a topic of conversation. And now just nine months in, I know we worked with you and the ACLJ worked with you uh, at the BDS summits at the UN. Uh, that doesn't feel like it was all that long ago. And it feels like we have, we have crashed so far in just this last year. Elections have consequences and the American public feel it now. And you know, all you have to do is look at um, Biden's disapproval ratings, whether it's on education, whether it's on COVID, whether it's on the economy, whether it's on Afghanistan, whether it's on the border. I mean, he is underwater in every one of those. And that's your average American saying, this is not the leadership that we wanted. This is not what we expected. And I think that, you know, I think the media is gonna have to come around and we're seeing that happen. I think you're already seeing the American public come around. The one we're waiting on is Biden and Kamala to do something. And instead of sitting there and answering questions on Afghanistan, instead of going to the border and seeing the problem, he's at a baseball game, right. you know, and, and Kamala is nowhere to be found. And that's just not gonna cut it for very long. And at some point, um, I think that there's gonna be this this outcry that, you know, maybe he can't cut it. Yeah, so what did, well, that, that brings up a very interesting point, but what do the American people do when you're right? We're only nine months into this presidency. So there are a lot of people who, who are disappointed in what they voted for. And there's a lot of people who clearly did not vote for this. A lot of times these issues do come up, you're right, towards the end of a end of a camp. You can get part of the election campaign can start happening, but we still have three years left, at least, until there's real change potentially in the White House. What do the American people do for the next three years when they see this horrifying imagery coming from uh, Afghanistan or they see what's happening at the border and they see all of these, it seems like every day there's a new crisis and they're not illegitimate. It's not a crisis that the media has created. These are real problems that are happening for real humans. That's the thing, we're looking at this as a, this is a big humanitarian crisis, like you brought up, whether it's COVID, whether it's the border, whether it's Afghanistan, whether we go to Israel and see what happened a month ago. These are issues that I think are compounding on people and they just simply, including myself, you kind of feel hopeless. But don't feel hopeless. We have a great opportunity and the opportunity is to stop the bleeding. You stop the bleeding by winning the House back, winning the Senate back in 2022, winning these governor's races. I have been all over the country campaigning for House, Senate, gubernatorial candidates. Um, the, and I'll tell you, the American people are ready for something different. That's where we have to remember that, yes, elections have consequences, and we have the chance to change that again in 2022. And I think it's going to be hugely important if we can just stop the damage that's happening right now. Yeah, people, I think, often forget that, that there are, are definitely checks and balances that can occur, but people have to be engaged. Yes. They have to see what's happening. They have to be engaged in their local elections. Local elections are, at some point, uh, are in some ways as, if not more important a lot of times than what's going on in the present because it affects people directly and, and not, only, not only it affects them, but it represents them. Uh, speaking of representation, I did want to, to, to wrap up where we seem to wrap up with everyone, which is we are 20 years past 9-11. There was a 20 year war uh, with a really 
horrible ending. But there was, from, from what people, I'll get your point of view as well, there was 20 years there where people like your family and your friends who served in Afghanistan, who were a part of this mission, that did a lot of good. There was a lot of good things happening. And, and I think it's easy to, and it's become a cliche I've said on here before, it's easy to judge the movie by the last five minutes when really you need to look at this, which is 20 years of relative peace. You had 20 years of uh, women and children having rights that they never would have had before. I know it's hard to look at it from that point of view, but I think it's important that we acknowledge always at the end of these, this series that people did not die in vain, that this was a war that was worthy and that it was something that was, was, had positive. Even if the ending was bad, there was positivity and good things that came out of it. I think people do look at this and there are troops that came out of this, family members, people who have passed, watch it and go, was any of this worth it? And I was curious your point of view. You know, I, I'm so proud of the men and women who have served in our military. I'm so proud of the ones that deployed and sacrificed and their families who sacrificed because we did not have a terrorist threat happen in on American soil. And that was the goal. The goal was how do we defeat terrorism? How do we keep another 9-11 from happening? And how do we let Americans know that they're safe? And the military allowed us that for 20 years. Now we have to go and figure out how do we get that to go, you know, even further? And, and I think that what I can tell you is the men and women of our military, they will do whatever it takes to keep Americans safe. And they will do whatever it takes to keep America free. And, you know, we have to remember that. And I think they are heroes. I think they will continue to be heroes. And we can't judge the military based on what a president did. I am incredibly proud of my husband and everyone else that served that allowed us to be safe the last 20 years. Well, thank you, Ambassador Haley. I really appreciate you taking uh, a little bit of your time out of your day to discuss this from a very unique perspective and unique point of view. Not many people, uh, look, we've had some great panelists on here, but not many people have the expertise and experience that you've had uh, in front of the UN. Because I think that is something that uh, it can get lost in the shuffle. We need to remember uh, why those uh, positions are, are very important like yours. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.